You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is June 25th, 2012, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, major histocompatibility testing. Our presenter is Dr. Adriana Stomet. He's the manager of the Heart Transplant Research Lab at Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics. Dr. Domen is in the uh, transplant immunology section. You're in cardiac transplant, is that right? That's correct, yes. Okay, so um, that, that requires histocompatibility compatibility testing and hopefully, um, uh, so, so uh, I guess without any further delay, I'll go ahead and turn the podium over to Dr. Josh Domen uh, and major histocompatibility compatibility testing. Well, welcome to Conferences Online Allergy, Dr. Domen. Uh, thank you. Um, yes, it's, uh, it's, uh, my, my background is mostly in, in uh, experimental bone marrow transplantation and uh, uh, hematopathic cells. That's how I rolled into the whole uh, transplant uh, uh, thing. So I'll be talking a bit about the histocompatibility testing uh, uh, today. Um, um, <coughs> really what we're talking about is uh, a whole lot uh, in excess of 100 genes, 6, 000, in excess of 6,000 alleles. So it's a, it's a complex uh, issue. Uh, uh, it's a compatibility uh, uh, regulated uh, by, by a great many uh, players. Um, one of the reasons people tend to get uh, uh, think of it as a difficult subject often. Um, what I'll be talking about uh, mostly is I'll go a little bit about uh, through the history um, uh, uh, of, of, of the development of the whole concept of uh, its compatibility, uh, a little bit about the structure and function and, and some of the assays involved in typing these days. Um, and really there's two terms uh, in use here, um, being a mouse person myself, I tend to say uh, MHC, which is how it was developed in mouse. In humans it's often referred to as HLA. Uh, since it was uh, originally recognized on, uh, uh, as leukocyte antigens. And it really took until uh, 1970 or so before people realized these were really the same uh, thing. So in mouse, it started in the 1940s with uh, <coughs> basically uh, tumor studies transplanting between uh, inbred mouse strains where it was found that there's a barrier if you go from one strain to the next while you can transplant the tumor within the strain. That was eventually uh, uh, recognized as histocompatibility compatibility genes. They were mapped to chromosome 17 in mouse, 6 in humans. It's uh, one huge uh, complex. Uh, those three areas that I showed in the first slide, they're, they're linked areas on the same chromosome. Um, their most important gene that was originally recognized was the histocompatibility compatibility 2 uh, locus. And in mouse, we still call this the H2 locus. Um, with three major genes, originally two later, three major genes, K, D, and L, uh, and different alleles that are present uh, 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 in, in red mouse strains. For instance, like 6 would have the B allele, about C has the D allele. So you would call that an H of K of B uh, uh, would be the K gene in a uh, black 6 uh, mouse. Uh, the function uh, uh, of these genes, however, was unclear for a long time uh, since the way they were discovered, which is really a, a tissue transplant or tumor transplant or skin transplant, really doesn't normally happen in vertebrates. Um, there are some exceptions to that rule, and right now there's one uh, big story with the uh, Tasmanian devil, which is a marsupial, which has a, uh, must have had some population bottlenecks in the past. They have a very limited uh, MHC diversity, and they've developed an infectious tumor, which is why, uh, currently wiping out the species. I think since 96, about 70% of the animals have died. Uh, this thing is spread through biting, which seems to be the main communication mode of these animals. They bite each other. Um, so uh, uh, tumor transplant does happen uh, uh, in, in real life, too, albeit very rarely. Um, Regular tissue transplants, however, you'd have to go back a, a, a lot further to, uh, to see examples of that happening. And the one example I know of uh, uh, and come to stand for this uh, uh, tunicates, which are protochordates. Um, so these animals split up at the very beginning of uh, vertebrate evolution. The larvae are free swimming and have a notochord, which is the uh, um, uh, forerunner of the, uh, of the backbone. Uh, but the adults are uh, sessile filter feeders. They attach and, uh, and they form these big colonies with a common tunic uh, covering them and a common vasculature. 
uh, and you see basically two colonies here, that, uh, uh, distinguished by the uh, different colors of the animals. Uh, each little panel is actually one, one complete animal. If two colonies bump into each other, one or two things happen. They either fuse and form one big colony, or they reject each other. And this is based on uh, a polyallelic uh, locus in the, in the genome. Turns out this is not really a molecular forerunner of our MHC uh, molecules uh, and, and tissue recognition, but it's a <coughs> molecular kind of, uh, 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 principle. But really, it, it, you, know, you have to go back a long time to really see uh, tissue transplants uh, uh, happening on a regular basis. But it does happen. Um, so, <coughs> Uh, continuing work on the uh, uh, MHC locus in the 1960s, so-called immune response genes were mapped there, and it was uh, realized that uh, MHC genes are essential for the immune response to protein antigens. Um, and it was recognized that uh, strains that can respond and non-respond, uh, depending on what kind of uh, uh, MHC genes they express. Um, in humans, you can do very much the same studies as you do in mouse. Uh, uh, this shows an example of skin grafts uh, uh, accepted and rejected in mouse and in humans, uh, and you get very much the same reaction. Uh, however, in mouse, you, you obviously can do the same kind of uh, genetic studies with inbred strains and, and, and crosses that you can do in, in mouse to define uh, these loci. Um, so the human studies uh, ended up being based on, uh, on, on serologically based on antibodies that were recognized uh, that uh, antibody responses against uh, white blood cells uh, that were recognized uh, to happen following either blood transfusions uh, or, or some of the early organ transplant. Um, so the human leukocyte antigen loci were defined serologically uh, by people finding this, 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 this response uh, uh, by exchanging cell lines, by exchanging uh, uh, sera. Uh, a huge uh, undertaking in the uh, beginning to kind of make any kind of sense of, of, of these data. Um, uh, Snell, Dosser, and uh, Ben Asaraf, uh, got the uh, Nobel Prize in 1980 for uh, the, deciphering this whole uh, uh, process. Um, obviously, there's a lot more people involved, and just a few uh, I mentioned here from Roden, Knight, uh, uh, Terrazaki at UCLA, McDevitt at Stanford, uh, Amos at, uh, at Duke. Um, and there was a second Nobel Prize uh, later for the uh, observation that uh, HLA restricts T cell responses. Uh, T cells can only respond if the right uh, HLA uh, is present, the one to which they uh, uh, were selected. Um, so basically, uh, 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 the biological function of these molecules is to present peptide antigens uh, to T lymphocytes to help initiate immune responses. And there really is two major groups of uh, 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 MHC or HLA. Class 1 is expressed in almost all of the, the uh, cells in your body. Uh, class 2 is uh, expressed in only a, a small subset of uh, so-called professional antigen-presenting cells, um, uh, dendritic cells, macrophages, B cells, things like that. Um, Class 1 obviously uh, uh, presents to CD8 uh, lymphocytes, uh, class 2 to CD4 lymphocytes, and uh, uh, it's essential for the, uh, the helper response. And obviously you need both in order to get an immune response uh, going. Um, this whole process uh, immediately made a lot of sense when the crystal structure was uh, uh, resolved finally in uh, 1987, uh, one of those occasions where you see the structure and it, it's immediately obvious what was happening. And this is one of the figures from the original paper. Basically, the structure is uh, uh, for class one. There's a heavy chain uh, and, and a, a beta two microglobulin uh, light chain. The heavy chain forms a beta pleated sheet with two alpha helices on top, in between which the peptide is bound and presented. Um, class two, the more restricted uh, version, has a similar structure, but there's two heavy chains that together form a, a very similar type of uh, binding and presenting uh, uh, region. Um, um, this, this, this shows another view of, of that region where peptides are bound uh, and presented, uh, and this is a very polymorphic uh, region. Um, the red residues here are the highly poly polymorphic regions, the green and, and purple are the uh, conserved regions, uh, the conserved residues uh, in, in this area. So the structure, the overall structure is the same, but different types of peptides can be bound and, and presented by different uh, uh, HLA alleles. 
and this kind of cartoon shows the uh, 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 the important features in, in this recognition process. Um, uh, so the MHC molecule binds the peptide of a certain length. These are all short peptides for different MHC molecules. They will bind peptides of different lengths. They are anchored by specific residues. And again, the exact placement and the type of residues that are used for anchoring uh, depends on the uh, uh, MHC uh, allele uh, that's being expressed. And then, of course, there is the uh, uh, <coughs> part of the uh, peptide sequence that's recognized by the T-cell receptor. Uh, in addition, the T-cell receptor, and this was the whole restriction process, also recognized the switch uh, polymorphic residues on the MHC molecule itself, uh, knowing so it can only uh, uh, give the correct response with the right uh, MHC molecule, uh, the, uh, the process of restriction that I mentioned earlier. Um, and this whole process then uh, uh, eventually uh, results in signals uh, being transmitted to T cells. It can be either activating uh, uh, signals uh, if the correct uh, uh, co-stimulation uh, 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 is, is, is given in addition to the uh, stimulation to the uh, uh, MHC and T cell receptor uh, interaction, or it can be an energic uh, type response in the uh, absence of the correct uh, co-stimuli uh, uh, where the T cell uh, rather than activates, uh, basically becomes unable to respond. Uh, one main difference uh, 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 between class 1 and class 2, uh, one further difference between the two is that class 1 uh, basically presents uh, endogenous peptides that are uh, processed bits of uh, proteins, uh, cell internal proteins, uh, that go through a very specific uh, uh, pathway uh, to get peptides bound onto the uh, uh, class 1 molecules that eventually move to the cell surface and present this for inspection by uh, T cells. Uh, class 2 antigens, on the other hand, mostly present uh, uh, exogenous uh, antigens that's taken up by these uh, uh, professional antigen presenting cells uh, uh, and then loaded onto the uh, uh, class 2 uh, molecules for uh, inspection. Okay, back to the uh, uh, MHC um, uh, system. Um, and like I said, this is a very big uh, system with a, a large number of genes uh, in there. Not all of these are involved in uh, uh, immune system genes, but uh, a very large number are. And they have a, a variety of different functions, with, uh, including uh, components of the uh, proteasome, uh, uh, the chaperone molecules, uh, heat shock proteins, uh, etc. Um, the ones that we really talk about when we're talking about um, uh, histocompatibility and tissue testing uh, typing is the uh, uh, class 1 and class 2 genes, uh, which are uh, the class 1 genes and the uh, uh, region on the top. Um, um, uh, uh, in the class 1 region, the class 2 are in the bottom, uh, uh, um, the HLA, DR, DQ, etc. Um, uh, with uh, uh, different genes in between. Uh, but those are the ones that we're really talking about uh, in, in the tissue typing allele. And these are also the, uh, the variable alleles uh, in, in this low side. Uh, the figure, I think, was from May 2010, has about four, four, uh, four or five thousand uh, uh, alleles noted. I think by January 2011, there was over six thousand uh, alleles recognized. Uh, um, um, most of the variability is in the class 1 region, but uh, uh, in class 2 has a significant number of alleles uh, uh, too. Um, a large number of uh, uh, conditions, uh, uh, diseases uh, uh, are associated with uh, uh, specific uh, uh, class 1 and class 2 alleles. Uh, um, uh, obviously, there's a, a large number of autoimmune diseases that, that correlates with uh, uh, very specific uh, haplotypes, um, uh, and there's a bunch uh, uh, listed here, which I'm sure is not an uh, exhaustive list. Uh, in addition to autoimmune diseases, there's uh, a great many other diseases, uh, uh, cancers, infection diseases, uh, drug sensitivities, etc., that uh, uh, are correlated with the presence of uh, a very specific uh, uh, alleles uh, uh, within the uh, major com compatibility uh, uh, locus. Um, um, so the 
that's obviously uh, um, a clear interest in, in, in testing uh, uh, what kind of uh, uh, alleles are being expressed on, on people. Um, you know, for one thing, it will give you some insight into uh, uh, the ability to uh, uh, a, great, a variety of diseases and uh, uh, autoimmune conditions. Um, it's obviously also uh, uh, of paramount importance in transplantation settings, which is uh, uh, more how I tend to think about it uh, from, from what I typically do. Um, if you do tissue transplants, be that uh, uh, hematopoietic uh, or, or solid organ, um, matching uh, um, antigens gives you a better outcome, basically. Um, and the uh, graph uh, shows outcome for bone marrow transplantation. This is uh, from 2009 data from the, uh, uh, the National Registry, which shows uh, people that were matched, uh, tested for eight alleles, and I have matched them all eight. Uh, on seven of eight or six of eight. And these are people that got an allogeneic transplant in the relatively early phases of the disease, so with a good chance of being, uh, being cured. Um, and basically what you see is uh, for every mismatched uh, uh, allele, you basically end up with about a 10% reduction in, uh, uh, in survival, uh, in the uh, survival rate. Um, to get people that are further along in their disease, uh, you get a lot more recurrence of disease, uh, which is going to uh, push the lines uh, together at the uh, at the low end. Um, so it makes a big difference uh, to get uh, a fairly high level testing. Uh, and I think in the bone marrow transplant setting, it's uh, people have moved beyond eight and are usually doing ten or twelve low side. I noticed that even with eight out of eight, it's not perfect. No. That means that there are other things besides HLA that also determine Yeah, so there's minor antigens as well, for one thing. And they um, seem to be pretty significant if 6 <coughs> fail, even if they're perfectly matched. Right. But, well, first of all, this is overall survival, so there's a lot of relapses right, other too. Things, um, yeah. So if you look at like, people in the later stage, it all kind of means down further. So. Yeah. Uh, bone marrow transplant for malignancy, you, you kind of got that, that thing going. But yeah, there is more than just HLA. And it's certainly more than just eight. He like said these days people test for ten or twelve in, in bone marrow transplants. So, and there's a fairly large number of genes that that where it helps to have matching. In organ transplant, so as organ transplant, uh, while there's also a better outcome with more matching, uh, the, the differences are not as big as here, and mm -hmm. it's not done as uh, uh, as high level. In a lot of cases, people uh, have been more worried about ABO matching really than HLA matching. Uh, um, uh, though for most, most things like the kidneys, they certainly do uh, HLA matching uh, these days. But it's not as bone marrow transplant tends, tends to be uh, up ahead. Uh, um, of course, in bone marrow transplant, in addition to the rejection of the graft, you have the problem that the graft may reject the, uh, uh, the host, uh, the graft versus host disease. Um, so it becomes even more important to do a uh, street. Um, the second thing that comes into mind when talking about testing in the tissue transplant situation is the uh, presence of uh, preformed antibodies against uh, uh, HLA in, in, in certain people, uh, uh, panoreactive uh, antibodies, um, which can be a major problem in, uh, uh, HLA, in, in, in transplant settings. Uh, and it's present in a fairly large number of, uh, of patients. Um, so that's the second thing uh, that comes into the uh, whole testing issue. Uh, it's a what what alleles are expressed and b what kind of uh, antibodies are present. Um, so there has been quite a development of uh, uh, of these assays over time. Uh, the initial assays are all serologically and cell based, and that was basically really the only assays through the uh, early nineties. Um, with sera be, being shared and uh, characterized cell lines are being shared between labs uh, um, uh, in order to get some kind of uh, uh, consistency in the, in, in the data. And that's not easy with these kinds of assays to get really consistent uh, readouts. Um, uh, even MLR assays specifically for class two uh, uh, alleles. Uh, these days, it's all been replaced by molecular, uh, mostly PCR-based assays uh, to uh, detect uh, what kind of alleles are being expressed. And you know, just saying, saying that we, we are now talking about 6,000 or so uh, uh, alleles, um, 
it, it, it becomes uh, almost impossible to do it any other way to uh, to get a, a full overview of, of, of if you want to do any kind of high resolution uh, uh, typing. Um, starting with these uh, cell-based uh, assays, um, the uh, uh, complement-dependent microlymphocytotoxicity assay that was developed uh, uh, in UCLA, um, which was basically uh, a, they developed a very a specific, very small uh, uh, culture uh, uh, plate, very small volumes um, that allowed them to test with the use of a very limited amount of uh, components. Um, the uh, company that developed from it was uh, I call one land out because that was kind of the amount of uh, one microliter is what you needed for a lot of components. Uh, it's a rapid and cost effective uh, type of assay. It uh, doesn't require many uh, uh, um, expensive, a lot of expensive equipment, but it's hard to standardize. Uh, uh, reagents are variable. Uh, like I say, most of the time, most of it, it, it it's used for live. It was used with uh, sera rather than uh, monoclonal antibodies. Eventually, those did get developed. Um, currently, it's not really much use for typing anymore. If if used at all, it's to analyze cross matches. So looking for antibodies uh, against specific uh, cells. Uh, that's called Terasaki at UCLA that developed the uh, so-called Terasaki plate, which is what it's still called, the uh, 60 well microtyper plate uh, uh, that was specifically developed such that the whole bottom area is visible in one microscope field uh, with a good phase contrast all the way to the edges. So you can actually find a single cell back in these wells, and I've done that a lot for uh, a stem cell assay. Uh, uh, they, they actually work great for that. Um, uh, something you could never do in that 96 uh, well plate, for instance, where uh, the straight edge is just uh, half of the bottom is, is invisible. Um, but so that that's what, what this particular paper was specifically developed for, for the very small scale uh, cytotoxicity assays, looking when cells are being lysed by uh, uh, sera uh, in the presence of, uh, <coughs> of rapid complement. Um, uh, then there is the uh, uh, mixed lymphocyte culture or mixed uh, uh, leukocyte uh, MLR type reactions that were done uh, mainly to uh, detect uh, class II molecules. And uh, if, if, if blood cells are uh, stimulated with uh, non-self uh, uh, class II molecules, that results in proliferation that can be measured by either incorporation of radioactivity or a reduction in uh, a cellular label like CFSE. Um, uh, the problem with these assays is they're very time-consuming, they're variable, they need lots of cells. Um, that was a, uh, uh, a little bit expanded version called prime lymphocyte typing, where you prime with a very specific uh, uh, haplotype first, so that, that gives you a little bit more specificity. But really, these assays are, are currently used as a research tool and not as a typing assay anymore. Um, so what is used these days are molecular uh, uh, typing assays. Um, the original uh, one that people uh, looked at was the restriction fragment length uh, polymorphism back in 1987. Uh, and uh, you basically look at the presence of a restriction site uh, that distinguishes low psi, uh, followed by uh, gel electrophoresis and uh, plotting and, and hybridization with specific probes. Uh, uh, has all been replaced by PCR-based uh, techniques these days. Um, the original technique is uh, called forward uh, uh, one of the early techniques is called forward SSOPH, uh, sequence-specific oligonucleotide probe hybridization. In this case, um, the test DNA uh, uh, from the, the subject is uh, uh, PCR amplified, uh, then immobilized uh, by binding into a membrane, uh, uh, and then hybridized with labeled probes. Uh, the problem with this assay is it's good if you want to test a, a large number of samples for the same probe. It's not very practical if you have one patient sample and you want to test it with a, a large number of different uh, uh, probes. So people flipped this around and uh, developed a reverse uh, SSOPH, uh, uh, um, where now the probes, the predefined oligos that are going to recognize specific genes, are hybridized, um, uh, 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 immobilized on the, on the substrate. Um, the test DNA is amplified and biotinylated, uh, then allowed to hybridize with the uh, probes. Uh, the probes can be either on glass microchips or uh, luminex beads uh, uh, is what's often used. 
Um, and this um, allows you to test a, a large number of different probes in a single uh, reaction. Uh, disadvantage uh, of that being the fact that um, you're going to have a lot of hybridizations going on the same hybridization condition. So there's going to be some differences in sensitivity um, for different uh, probes. Uh, Luminax uh, basically is a uh, flow cytometry based uh, system um, where the company uh, is it, basically three color flow cytometer. Uh, two colors are used to distinguish uh, different uh, beads. Uh, a third color is used to distinguish how much binds to the beads. Uh, and the beads are made by the company by mixing in uh, two different fluoroprobes in the or they make the beads at ten distinct levels. That gives you a total of hundred different colors within the beads. Um, each of these different colors is bound to a, uh, uh, in this case, to a specific uh, uh, set, the polygonucleotide, uh, which then allows it to, to bind and hybridize. Um, so practically speaking, uh, one uh, type of bead would be uh, bound to, uh, say, a DR15 probe, one to a DR16, etc., etc. So you can have a hundred different probes in, in this uh, setup. Uh, they, those are mixed with the uh, amplified and biotinylated DNA, a lot of hybridized uh, <coughs> uh, Then the uh, biotin can be recognized by streptavidin PE. Uh, then the beads are run through the, uh, like I say, the, spe the specific uh, flow cytometer, uh, which recognizes what what bead binds the uh, uh, PE, and you know from uh, the color combination in the bead which uh, uh, and which probe is bound to the bead. So in a single reaction, you can look at a hundred different uh, uh, hybridizations and get a rapid uh, readout. Um, uh, and there's a, a more a standard PCR, uh, sequence-specific primer PCR, which uh, is rapid, doesn't need the expensive instrumentation, but obviously uh, requires a great many PCR reactions for a higher resolution typing. So uh, uh, not as good for a standard uh, typing reactions. Um, and beyond that, of course, the uh, uh, ultimate uh, allele recognition comes from uh, uh, sequence-based uh, typing. Um, this is the most powerful uh, uh, tool. In that it's the only really tool that can uh, identify unrecognized alleles. Uh, there's no prior uh, knowledge necessary about what, what, what the allele sequence is or the protein uh, uh, sequence is. Um, however, uh, in a standard type, uh, uh, um, sequence reactions, uh, since you're in, in a human situation, there's always two different alleles. Uh, uh, it can be somewhat ambiguous to uh, uh, identify uh, what, what sequence goes with what allele um, uh, in short reactions. And of course, what everybody really is waiting for is uh, next generation sequencing techniques where either the whole genome sequence is available or you can basically order a uh, whole MHC uh, uh, sequence uh, reaction uh, uh, fairly easily. Uh, and that would give you the, the full the highest resolution type uh, uh, analysis of, of what's present. Uh, this table, uh, and I'm not going to go through it, basically uh, summarizes what I uh, just went through, the uh, development of the different uh, techniques. Um, and there are pros and cons and turnaround times, et cetera. Um, since there are so many alleles, uh, nomenclature uh, becomes uh, a, a problem, and I think this is kind of uh, what was uh, uh, suggested by uh, the 2010 uh, work group as a uh, kind of nomenclature uh, with HLA first, then the, the gene, then different kinds of uh, allele groups and uh, uh, proteins, as well as types of mutations that are present. Uh, uh, you get this combination of up to four numbers. Uh, and then the, in the end, a letter which uh, is indicative of protein expression and means non-expressed, uh, as would mean soluble only, uh, et cetera. Uh, and this undoubtedly will change as more loci are developed. But just nomenclature with so many different alleles becomes a, a, a problem. And then, like I say, it's not just HLA. There are minor antigens as well. Uh, there are MK-type uh, reactions for uh, uh, receptors that whose matching can, can be important in, in the outcome as well. Minor antigens can basically be anything almost that, that, that's different between the uh, host and the donor. In a lot of cases, it's obviously undefined. Um, much less important in the outcome, uh, but in 
certain cases, for instance, have been important in, in inducing GBA uh, crafts or this tumor response to them. Mismatch that can actually be important, uh, might be used that way. And a similar type of stories for the uh, uh, MK cells and the, the GERS. Um, uh, so the uh, uh, <coughs> last part of, of testing is the uh, anti-HLA antibodies, uh, which may be present and which can be a, a particular problem in, in transplant uh, situations. Uh, and these can develop through exposure to uh, uh, foreign HLA antigens, uh, uh, which happens in pregnancy, um, blood transfusion, and, and, and transplantation. However, even when all of these are lacking, you can still have antibodies, and those can come through molecular mimicry. It's basically you develop antibodies against something completely different, but they cross-react. Uh, there's obviously no negative selection against the reactivity of, uh, of HLA that you don't express and that you've never seen. Um, so this is a significant barrier, uh, and the number here up to one-third sensitized. It depends on what organ you look at, and then it depends on what uh, uh, people you talk to, since every institution has uh, uh, different assays and comes up with quite different numbers. Um, but the basic take-home here, it, it happens in a lot of, a lot of cases. It's not rare um, uh, to see sensitized patients, and it restricts the use of, of organs. Uh, and some people think it's actually kind of tends to go up uh, as normal blood transfusion, et cetera, are given. So there's a similar kind of uh, development here in assays that was the case for the uh, uh, recognition of the uh, uh, HLA alleles themselves. It starts off as cell-based serological assays, except in the original assays, you take the test cells and you incubate them with known sera. Here you take known cells and you incubate them with an unknown sera and you see which ones are being biased. Um, so UCLA, uh, the, the digitizing that like that lab there for I think 15 or 20 years, they send every week they send out batches of cells to a whole bunch of labs specifically for to allow this kind of testing to happen. Um, these days, it all uh, again is being replaced by solid phase testing with uh, cloned components that gives more uh, reproducible type uh, uh, outcomes. Um, Flow cytometry was really, and that's not really a solid phase uh, uh, assay, obviously, um, uh, was, was the first major improvement to, to check uh, for the staining of uh, the ability of a certain serum batch to stain uh, specific uh, known cells uh, and how many uh, are being stained, uh, um, which gives you a certain BRA number, often indicated as, as a percent. Um, so you incubate cells with serum and then the secondary directly. The, uh, the bound antibodies. Uh, solid phase would be uh, things like ELISA and again uh, uh, bead arrays uh, uh, like uh, Luminex beads, uh, which are used a lot. Uh, so Luminex assays uh, uh, were not were quite similar to what, what, what was used, what I described for the uh, 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 the nucleotide hybridization. Uh, in addition to nucleotide, you can bind proteins to these beads. Uh, and so you get 100 different beads with 100 different uh, uh, HLA antigens coated on them, either as whole or as <laughs> um, uh, Those are incubated with the serum. The uh, antibodies <laughs> recognize the uh, HLA, certain HLA, but not others. Um, and then secondary antibodies recognize that those antibodies on there. Then you run them through the uh, uh, Luminex machine. This is kind of what it looks like with the how the machine sees all the different beads. And at the bottom for each beat would be the uh, fluorescence in the uh, uh, in, in the third uh, uh, channel, which recognizes the uh, uh, antibody binding. Uh, and there's newer assays continuously and improvement being developed. Uh, this is a variant that was recently developed uh, uh, by Dolly T and at uh, Stanford, uh, where they found that it's not so much the presence of antibodies uh, uh, that that was a problem, but it's complement binding antibodies specifically that, that were a problem. So they changed the test to, uh, to, to only look at those uh, 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 antibodies by mixing in uh, a complement uh, uh, factor C1Q in the assay um, uh, with the serum. Um, in this case, the um, if the preformed antibodies against certain uh, uh, HLA antigen present, those bind. Uh, but then rather than using antibodies against uh, the primary antibodies, they use antibodies against the C1Q uh, as it is bound to those primary antibodies. So you're only going to recognize a subset of the uh, HLA recognizing antibodies. And they find uh, a much better correlation with, with uh, adverse outcome than uh, 
just by looking at, at, at antibodies as a whole. So this, this is something that is in continuous uh, development uh, and, and new techniques are, are being developed here. Uh, again, uh, a kind of an overview of these uh, uh, different assays uh, uh, as they're being done uh, during the run times. But uh, uh, advantages, disadvantages uh, to the different uh, uh, assays. Um, what this kind of has uh, uh, ended up uh, doing is, uh, or what, what is done uh, often now, um, is, is what is called a virtual cross match is being made. Uh, so originally what needed to be done, uh, if there was a uh, patient that needed an organ and there wasn't an uh, organ uh, available, an actual cross-match needed to be done to test for the presence of antibodies. Uh, in a virtual cross-match, you basically test in, in a patient uh, whatever antibodies are present, and then once you know the HLA, the haplotype of the uh, donor, you can predict whether or not um, uh, a response is going to happen without actually testing that. Um, so this information can be present uh, before the, uh, the donor is even identified. Uh, uh, it's known what, what, the, what, what a certain transplant candidate would be uh, reacting against and what organs uh, shouldn't be offered. Uh, and this greatly speeds up uh, the whole process. And uh, as people have found, this is, this is really an excellent correlation uh, uh, with the virtual cross match and outcome. Um, so this is all based on the uh, the newer assay with the solid phase uh, uh, immunoassays, um, and that has a uh, uh, excellent uh, uh, correlation with outcomes. Um, and I think that uh, basically uh, um, where I was going to stop. Um, so there, there has been a uh, you know a, a big development in assays, uh, and that's continuing to happen uh, as. as different fields are being uh, defined, uh, but like I say, in, in, in a lot of ways, the, the final assay of people are, you know, being in the ultimate assay is the sequence analysis. Yeah, when, once we have the full sequence, then you've got everything. Exactly. But do you think that will make these other assays obsolete, or do you still need the function of some of the assays? So, some of the, I mean, people are still doing the cell-based assays, even mm -hmm. uh, as sequencing is available. You know, in granular <coughs> places, but for certain, uh, uh, I think a lot of the assays would be replaced, since uh, they're mm -hmm. not going to be uh, uh, that much, much need for it. Uh, you might want to look at things like expression, uh, um, which you know, mm -hmm. isn't always exactly predictable from sequence, uh, 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 what is expressed, what is not expressed, because a lot of the mutations are they're not just within the genes, they're also in uh, control regions. Uh, um, so I think at some level, some correlate, uh, confirmation uh, will, will probably, you, you will need the kind of assays to have them available when, whenever it's needed. But I think that the use will be a lot less. Than so, so if I had a patient right now who needed an organ transplant, what, which assay would you use today to determine whether the donor is compatible with the recipient? Uh, it really depends on uh, what the, uh, the assays are and the institutions that, that would be handling We're right here at Children's Mercy. Uh, I don't exactly know what Children's uses. So like I say, I do <laughs> mouse transplants. Um, but so if I have a mouse, then me. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you exactly what. Uh, but, but, but even uh, that, that's going to be a multi-institution, so it, it's not even just a single institution since UNOS uh, really regulates uh, a, a lot of that. But the actual assays are, are going to be done within, within the institution. It would be one of the molecular assays at, at the moment, really, that, that, that's being done. Um, <clears throat> see, see, the issue I can see with the sequencing, once you have the whole sequence, you're going to be overwhelmed with so much information, it may almost be too much. Are some alleles more closely related to each other than others that you could say, oh, yeah. if there's seven matches out of eight, but this one is actually not so bad because it's similar enough to that one that it, it's matches as opposed to being different. I mean, is it, does it work like that, too? Uh, to, to a certain extent, yes. And this keeps getting refined, and especially in the serological days. Uh, uh, for instance, what was called one allele then turns out to be two alleles because uh, you have an antibody that recognizes something and it's called A9, and then you get beta sera, and all of a sudden there's an A23 and an A24, which together used to be called A9. Um, uh, you know things like that. So yes, uh, they're going to be the 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 linked into groups. Um, 
uh, with specific type, types of uh, mutations, yes, uh, and specific type, type, types of uh, protein structures. Um, you know, the, the more knowledge becomes available, and the more uh, the more clear it will become eventually. Yeah, what what things are important and what things are not important, uh, and a lot of that will come eventually from. The, the ultimate uh, is going to be the sequence analysis once that's available. In, uh, mm -hmm. Are there any effects from glycosylation on HLA recognition? Does that play a role? Um, Carbohydrate and weight. Right. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not sure what is the differential. Uh, to be honest, <clears throat> that's a good question. Uh, uh, that that uh, um, uh, obviously. You, you, if you start having mutations, they can affect like like oscillation. If you lose the right molecules, you're going to uh, affect. Uh, you're going to lose the ability to bind, and um, uh, that 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 should certainly affect like oscillation patterns, and that can certainly recognize uh, function both function and, and, and recognition by antibodies. Um, right. Just so I'm thinking, if there's a single allele that is more glycosylated in one individual and not in the other, because they have different enzymes that would attach carbohydrate and moieties. Would that have an impact on uh, histocompatibility between two people with otherwise identical sequences? Well, yeah, you couldn't do it in people, of course, since they're not going to be identical. Uh, uh, that's all you're going to be. You would have to do it. You would have to do something like that in a mouse setting with specific mm -hmm. mutations. Um, off the top of my head, <coughs> excuse me, another way whether somebody has actually done that test. Yeah. But yeah, if you're going to get differences in glycosylation, that might certainly affect uh, uh, function here. Um, and you actually would have to be somewhat careful not to destroy all function uh, if you really start messing with the black oscillation. Uh, in a human setting, like I say, yeah, be, there's going to be so many more differences that it's going to be hard to really say that, that it's dependent on that one thing uh, only. Well, very interesting. <clears throat> Are there any uh, questions or comments from any of the audience? Anybody else? Oop. Uh, go ahead, Brock. Uh, yeah, that, that brought back a lot of memories. Uh, we did a lot of transplants in rats because they only had one major histocompatibility. And, and actually, I uh, uh, isolated some minor histocompatibility antigens. But is there anything new on the idea of why these uh, loci are so polymorphic? Um. The, the basic uh, uh, idea is the ability to present uh, uh, you know, the many different types, types of antigens, uh, uh, peptide antigens, uh, uh, and you want as wide a range as possible. Um, and again, it, it, it allows you to respond to a, to a great many diseases and, 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 and uh, infectious complications. Um, that uh, tumor in those uh, uh, Tasmanian devils is kind of a uh, you know a very rare and weird event, but. Things like that could, could happen with, with infectious complications as well. And it's not really, I think there's some other tumors that have been noted in the past that are infectious. Um, it's a pretty rare thing, but both in dogs, I think, in Syrian hamsters, there's claims at least in the 60s that there were uh, infectious tumors. So things like that that happen, but more, more uh, a stronger uh, reason for it, I would, would be thinking, is infectious complications with uh, you know, all sorts of organisms. But if you if you are you have something that's you can mount a protective response and you lose that uh, to another allele, then that would be a disadvantage. So it wouldn't that would kind of reduce the the polymorphism, wouldn't it? Sorry. Uh, if, uh, if you if if you uh, uh, let's say you have an allele that actually uh, is functional and it protects you from uh, particular infections, and you lose that because of the polymorphism in right. the generation, then, then that would sort of uh, say that, uh, you know, that would be selected against the polymorphism, so then, you know, you wouldn't think it would be that polymorphic if that was the reason. Right, but you would be protected against something else. Uh, the selection is going to be at the population level, of course, rather than uh, uh, it's going to be a whole population that thrives rather than an individual. Um, so yes, and certain things are going to be a lot more pressure, of course. If there's you know certain things that everybody gets, uh, you want some some ability to present those peptides. Otherwise, uh, you're going to have have problems. Um, but if it's something pre pretty rare, um, 
you know, you, as a population, you might lose out if you don't have that ability in there somewhere, at least have some potential. <clears throat> it would be interesting to see if a uh, certain bacteria in, is better fought by certain HLA haplotypes if when that bacteria, maybe that virus, goes through a population, is there a selection for people who have that haplotype to be better reproducers and have more offspring over, over time, you might actually change the haplotype uh, profile of the population depending on which infectious agents are present at that particular time. I think that's been done for some conditions like the plague during middle, the Middle Ages right. when they sequenced or looked at HLA mm -hmm. in uh, bones of people before and after the plague and were able to show a difference in the, in the pattern of HLA sequence. I, I right. sort of remember that. Yeah, and there's quite, quite large differences between populations in terms of frequencies of the various uh, HLA alleles. Well, very. A syphilis might be a good example in that. <clears throat> you know, one thing that I've always thought would be a, a dream would be uh, for a solid organ, there, there's a problem with producing solid organs that are compatible with the recipient if you wanted to artificially construct them. But would it be possible to create cells that don't have HLA that if they're not immunologically active, that would, shouldn't hurt their function. But if they had no HLA, you could produce organs from those, and then they would be transplantable into anyone who would receive them. Is that is that possible, or am I totally off line? Well, that's things like in case cells uh, that kick in uh, uh, that are going to complicate matters. Uh, uh, <coughs> it's right. yield, so it's not just the absence of not HLA. Not just HLA, but and if you think about Xeno, where people have been thinking along that route, then, then you yeah. get various uh, <coughs> sugar that really give a much stronger initial response uh, that, that you would have to get rid of as well. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's a little bit more complicated than, than just getting rid of, uh, of HLA, yes. Well, um, and of course, it makes you vulnerable to infections, etc. Uh, or at least that particular organ. Right. The rest of the... Right, no, exactly for that, that particular it. organ, yes, exactly. So if a virus got it, they wouldn't be yeah. able to produce class 1 and be a signal that would help fight the infection, so that would that's yeah. interesting. Well, Go ahead, Brock. Uh, one more question. Uh, on these minor histocompatibility compatibility aller antigens, they, uh, have they been identified functionally? Uh, some have, but it can basically be any uh, uh, allelic uh, uh, protein. You know, in males we think about things like HY, which expressed in males but not in females, and, and humans, you know, mm. a bunch of them have been identified too, but uh, um, it, it can be almost anything, so it, okay. it would be very hard to make a complete uh, list of those. Okay. But yes, a, a number of them certainly have been uh, identified that can act mm -hmm. as such. So the only perfect recipient and donor would be identical twins. <laughs> right. And even there you've got to worry about epigenetics, perhaps. All right. Well, thank you so much. That was a great overview. We really yeah. appreciate your coming today. We're going to have to stop there. Brock had the final word, as always. Um, we're going to take about a three-minute break for everyone to get set up for our next presentation, and then we'll be back. This is Conferences on Line Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City. We'll be back in just a few minutes. This has been an ACAAI production. To learn more about conferences on line allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, go to www.acaai.org. See you next time. <laughs>